Anyhow, that's it for politics. What I want to talk about, there's a story that came out on Zero Hedge today. And this is a long, complicated story, and, and it's too long and too complicated for us to dissect here on this program uh, in a few minutes. And I would recommend that you take time yes. to go to Zero Hedge and read it for yourself. It's not an easy read, all right? If you're, if you're a financial market savvy, it, it, you'll be able to read it. But for the average person, it's, it's a complicated article. Um, it is entitled, It's About to Get Very Bad. There it is, Zero Hedge. Repo market legend predicts market crash in days. Days? This, in days. This is at the top of Zero Hedge uh, about an hour ago. It was at the top of their page. And um, what has uh, Zero Hedge really troubled is that this man right here, Zoltan Pazar uh, is one of the most admired and respected people on Wall Street. He's a Hungarian. Uh, Zero Hedge said he laid the groundwork for our current understanding of the deposit free shadow banking system. And it goes on to say that uh, uh, that he's basically um, the 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 expert, the expert on the repo market. It said he was instrumental during his tenure at both the United States Treasury and the New York Fed in laying the foundations of the modern repo market, orchestrating the response to the global financial system and ensuring policy debate, serving as a point person on market development for Fed, Treasury, and White House officials throughout the crisis, playing the key role in building uh, the, uh, um, what is the uh, TARP, uh, it's not TARP, uh, TALF, to uh, backstop the ABS market and advising the former head of the Fed's market desk, Brian Sack, on just how the New York Fed should implement its various market interventions without disrupting and breaking the most important market of all, the multi-trillion dollar, multi-trillion dollar repo market. All right, what does all that say? He's really smart. Yes. Okay. Right. He's really smart. He's, He's what we have at. He's as smarter the, than all three of us here to, together about the repo market. Right. But he basically built the repo market. Yes. For the government. So yes, for the for the Fed, the Treasury Department. This guy is saying that within days that very system is going to crash. It, it is. I, I think what he's saying is it, it, the crash is very likely within days. I'm going to give it, you know, because it will crash and likely, all right? Give it a little bit of room there. He's sending out a warning that we're in a danger zone, that it, the repo market could crash within days. Doc, this is the real story. It's not Jerry Nadler's goat rodeo. Right. It's not Adam Schiff's circus. This is the real story, that the... Wall Street repo market is teetering on collapse, which would bring down major banks in the United States of, Amer of America. At the same time that they're impeaching the president of the United States. Yes. And you don't think we're, we can't go into a revolution, civil war? Let the banks close the same week that they impeach the president. Mm. And we saw what happened when their bank closures in Greece, for example, when they went through their financial crisis. People were in the streets. There was a pseudo-revolution in that country due to a fact you couldn't get your very own money. There are limits on withdrawals. And the international bankers removed the prime minister and put one of their own boys in. That's right. If you they, remember, they, they went through a couple countries, Italy and several nations, and removed the prime ministers and put bankers in their jobs. But that can't happen here, can it, Rick? Yes, it can. Absolutely it can. And this story... I, I strongly encourage you to go to Zero Hedge, uh, ZeroHedge.com and read this story. It is quite long. It's about seven, eight pages here. Uh, but what he is saying is that we are teetering on the edge of a massive collapse of the multi-trillion dollar repo market. 
And I don't know what that looks like other than it's not good. Well, he was not alone, uh, I'd say, in this month to say that there's financial calamity around the corner, not just for America, but for uh, the economic markets throughout the world. Uh, billionaire Ray Dalio, about a month yes. ago now, forecasted something very similar in, in the catastrophic, the chaotic nature. Uh, Ray Dalio said due to repo, due to the financial policy of the Fed and the Treasury uh, Department, the country may be on the brink, uh, potentially the same financial crisis which led to World War II. I know. And I want to get to that in a minute, Edward. I, there's a couple of things we, I want to show before we go there. Uh, do we have the chart that went with that zero hedge? Yes, yes All we right. do. It's number six for control. Okay, so right. this is the chart that's in the zero hedge article. And to the, uh, I, I don't have a copy in front of me, to the, um, the lower left, that is where the repo market was at in September of, September. of this year. Right. This year. And that represents, uh, can you read at the total top? The blue, the blue, the blue is blue what? Is total overnight repo supplied by the Fed, the Federal Reserve. All right, so the blue is the, the amount that the Fed put in. That's, so you, if you look at the lower left, that's Feb, uh, the September of 2019. So it started the, at zero. The yellow is what? The yellow is total term repo supplied by the Federal Reserve. And red, and again, the, the yellow actually began right there in September too, but the red is treasury bills purchased by the Fed, T-bills. All right, so Doc, where were we in the blue in September of 2019? In September, mid-September, we started off basically at zero. At zero. Because they were only using the repo market at that time for quick transactions like, you know, 10, $20 million at a time, you know, not, not, we're not talking billions of dollars. And paid back and, overnight. And paid That's, back overnight. Right. So within a couple of weeks in September, what's that first peak? What, what is that, 110, I can't. That's 80 billion. 80 billion is what the Fed put in? Yes. Okay, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have one printed out. I should have brought one with me. But it's been accumulating over well, where the Where are we at, where's the blue at now in December? Uh, the upper right. $320 billion. $320 billion the Fed has pumped in. And that, that number even seems a little light based on the calculation that Doc was looking yes, at, based yes. on the actual numbers seeing daily, between $46 billion and $75 billion daily since, since October. It's clearly into the trillions if you do that math. Yes. So that's keep not a good chart. No. That is, so, all right, that's not a good chart. for Christmas. That's not a good chart. The so, Fed can't pump enough money into the banking system at night. So it used to be, you know, let's keep the chart up, it used to be that banks kept reserves of cash on hand, right, that they would use to, you know, take care of overnight transactions and things like that. But something happened over the course of uh, the summer and into September where suddenly these major financial institutions uh, started running low on cash. They were getting pulled out. Uh, especially by hedge funds and some other uh, financial institutions out there, there was a change in thinking. And this was never what the repo market was uh, designed for, a change in thinking from using their reserves to moving to collateral. And by uh, getting these reserve funds from the uh, Federal Reserve in this way, they were treating this like collateral, Rick, mm -hmm. like, like a physical asset. Mm -hmm. And so as this continued to develop, they haven't put this money back into the system yet. This money is being distributed out into the market. Another alarming thing on this chart, Rick, if you'll look at it there at the red, the red is the Fed actually buying back treasuries to pump up the market. So they're putting out the treasury bonds and also buying them back. So they're juicing up the numbers, pushing up the numbers. They're buying back their own debt. Yes. There so, we go. Thank you. Uh, so this is, uh, I know for a lot of people, this may be a confusing number to look at, but let's say that you had a whole bunch of credit cards, right? And you start borrowing against your credit cards. You're using your credit cards to buy groceries at Publix or Winn-Dixie or whatever. Or you're using your credit cards to make your car payment or, all, or, or to uh, uh, buy your kids tennis shoes for schools or even their school supplies. But you're not paying back the credit cards. So you've got, you're starting to get maxed out on all your cards. At some point, you're going to have to pay off those cards. You're, at some point, 
it's going to catch up with you. Especially and, interest. And what we're seeing right now here at the far uh, right of the chart, Rick, is we're actually using other credit cards to make our credit card payments. That's, That's when you know you're scenario. in trouble. That's right. when you know you're in trouble, when you... You use a credit card to make a payment on a credit card. Yes, and that's where we're at on this. This is the story nobody out there is talking about. Now we're talking about Jerry Nadler and Adam Schiff and Nancy Pelosi and a bunch of baloney in Ukraine, which is all diversion from what's really happening. It's a circus. They got the clowns, the Jerry Nadler rodeo. The court justice. The go yes, that's what they are. Court jesters, it's, it's all clown show. Get the people fighting and arguing over here. Look at this. Right. That's what's really going on. Right. That chart is what is, that's reality. So this money that's being pumped back into the financial system is going somewhere. Where is it, it going? It's not sitting in bank accounts because they're having to borrow money again every night, right? Look, the thing about a repo is it, it means... Repo means repurchase. repurchase. It doesn't mean you're, you're seizing it, taking right. it, you know, repossessing it. It means the bank repurchases and it's done overnight. So if this money is going out and the banks are supposed to repurchase it within 24 hours, why is more money going out? The banks aren't paying it back? Basically, yes. They're not paying it back. Not only they, they're not paying it back, but they need more? Yes, and they keep coming back. That's why you see the uh, accumulation going on. In, in a lot of ways, we're calling this the shadow QE. I mean, because it's pumping funds into the economy. QE being quantitative easing. And mm -hmm. so it's uh, QE that's not QE. That's kind of the joke in the financial markets about what's going on here right now. That money is being pumped into the markets, just like any other, you know, let's print some more money and throw it out there. Uh, but instead... They, they know that people aren't accepting that anymore. So there's got to be another way we can get funds into the market. So the question becomes now, all right, so these funds are going into the system. Where are these funds going? They're not sitting in banks because if they were sitting in banks, the banks wouldn't have to come back and borrow every night, right? And we'll so be they're the going effect. out the door. So they're paying off uh, obligations on hedge funds, the risk funds, maybe investments maybe even the stock market. And so there are people that are earning from this. Maybe even, I mean, if you have a 401k and your 401k is going up, you're probably going, wow, that's wonderful. Look at this, happy days are here again. Look at the stock market, we're at 27, 28, 29, 30,000. Who is buying those stocks? Hedge funds, investment funds, 401ks. Where are they getting the money, Rick? They're getting it from this. That's the scary part. So are we seeing a shadow inflation of the market? You know, there's only so much hot air you can put in a balloon, Rick. One of the things that Zoltan Pazar, again, the founder of this very mechanism, noted is that at least one large U.S. bank appears to be pricing some of its FX swap trades, such as it misses those trades, as a polite way of clamping down on market activity. He specifically said that at least one large U.S. bank appears to be gearing for a collapse yes. in the FX swap market. One major U.S. bank appears to be preparing for a collapse yes. of the repo market. And this is, this is happening on the uh, year anniversary of the last time. Uh, remember Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin canceling his Cancun vacation last Christmas, meeting with and speaking with top bank officials. One of these bank officials, right. that was last that Christmas. Was a, I remember, and there was a judge, a Supreme Court judge that was called then, I believe the Chief Justice yes. of the report was correct, to come in and make a decision on an emergency case yes. in relation to something serious, a crisis of uh, national uh, proportion. And, and it was earlier this year that Mr. Mnuchin called the, the chairmen of the biggest banks and asked them, how much money you got in the bank? Uh, what's right. your liquidity? Remember that weekend? Yes. Over when the he weekend. Called him up yeah. From his uh, resort in Cancun. Hey, Steve here. <laughs> I'm in Cancun right I'm now. I'm just wondering how, how much money's in the vault right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not funny, though. It's, this is a very serious crisis. Well, the, the Zero Hedge story says that Zoltan Polzar, the, the man who basically created the repo market for the Fed, that he is uh, nervously worried that the banks could. There could be a seizure 
I'm talking about a, uh, the, the market's locking up, mm -hmm. all right? Um, going into Caesar, uh, by the end of this year, by the end of December, this next story, this is uh, number four, marketwatch.com. Wall Street players without access to Fed liquidity may feel pain if repo market seizes up at year end. And what's significant about that, Rick, is not everybody has access to this money. Of course only, not. Only the big boys the have insiders. Access. The ones that survived so, the 2008 financial so crisis. If you get to the year end, and we, that's when you have to you know, account for your balance sheets, all the banks, all the financial players do, all the hedge funds do, and you find yourself, wait a minute, we're, we're running a little short here on the balance sheet day to day. Let's go over here to the Fed and see if we can tap in on this, uh, you know, these uh, daily repo funds. Guess what? There's only so many people getting, so many firms and organizations that can line up. And some firms and organizations, of course, have priority because, remember that famous phrase, they're too big to fail. Mm -hmm. That's what you're telling the bank bailouts of 2008. Right. And so they've protected a few, uh, a, a class of, of banks and financial institutions. Too big to fail or too big to jail? Too big, to, well, they, they would say both. both. So, but, so okay. that's, but, so you're going to have a lot of firms that are going to find themselves suddenly short here. Well, what are we, what are we going to do? Well, then they're going to be easy pickings for these major financial institutions that are still in the game that can still access these funds. I mean, it's, oh, wow, it's, it's a dirty game. It is. Uh, the next one, Market Watch, Market Watch uh, this is number five, uh, headline, the repo market is broken and Fed injections are not a lasting solution, market pros warn. Uh, this, uh, this story came out just a few days ago, December 7th. The man who produced that chart, Rick, that yes. we were just looking at, uh, James Bianco, the founder of Bianco Research in Chicago, he said the, pi the big picture answer is that the repo market is broken. They're essentially medicating the market in a submission, but this is not a long-term solution. What's, what's the point we're making? Um, it's December 10th. Right. And we have two major events going on in December, and few people are paying attention to it. The President of the United States is being impeached, and the banking system is teetering on collapse. That is a recipe for revolution. An old-fashioned Bolshevik revolution. Jacobin. Jacobin revolution. It'd be more, more appropriate because that, their the, heads banks, off. the banks failed along with that, too. Right. That's right. This is Jacobin. Yeah, the, the Bolsheviks shot you in the head and the Jacobins cut your head off. Mm. Why waste a bullet when you can just remove the head? Uh, the modern equivalents are calling to eat the rich. So we know the calls are out there already. All right. So that's where we're at right now. And, and that's why I'm alarmed. And people can make fun of me. They can laugh. They can do anything you want. I'm not the one making the movies like The Purge. It's not me. Yeah, you're not the one hiring Josh Raffel, the one who worked in the White House under Jared Kushner one who was working for Blum Productions, yeah. producer of The Perch. I, I've never done a comedy routine holding the bloody head of the President yeah, of the United Kathy States. Kathy Griffin. Or held a play where the President was killed on stage. Right. Or, or done an a on-street uh, execution. That's right, having an organ. Yes. yes. Where they, they decapitated the, the President in a, in a mock execution on the streets of Oregon. All right? I didn't do any of that stuff. But those people haven't been shut down. And they haven't been censored. Right. All right. They've, they've been allowed to flourish. And, and I've been warning people and calling for calm heads to calm down the situation in the country. Well, here we are well, now. We We're still in have heads. Ah, why do you still have heads? Because I, see, I read history. So I know where this goes. All right. Yeah, you know, this has happened before. If, if you read history and you study history, you know the patterns. And I've seen this happen in the past. This is coming again. We're, we have the conditions. It's the conditions, all right? So you can have the conditions uh, weather-wise for a tornado. Mm. It doesn't mean a tornado forms. Right. And even if a tornado forms, it doesn't mean that the funnel touches down. It just says the conditions are ripe for an F5 tornado. We're under tornado watch. Right now. So then you go to a tornado warning, all right? 
But that's where we're at politically and socially in America. We are in a tornado warning period right now. And it's we're, we're dangerous. Not the we're reporting on it, but there are other billionaires, other main uh, established, well-respected financial experts who are also uh, raising the alarm bells about the current state of the economy. So Ray Dalio, you were talking about him a minute ago. Yeah, so he was speaking at a conference called the Greenwich Economic Forum, hosted in conjunction with Yahoo Finance at the beginning of November. This is about a month and a bit ago. And he was known there are three major issues he sees on the horizon, and it was actually in direct correlation with the beginning of repo. At the time uh, he was speaking, it had been going for about a month. We've known repo, no one was discussing it. But Ray Dalio, uh, me mega investor, a billionaire, was watching this and said this is troubling. Specifically, he said the conditions, as you were noting, the conditions are very similar to the last time the whole world erupted into war. Let's watch. Watch, watch uh, a video clip, Ray Dalio, at, at the Yahoo Finance seminar. So I think we should talk about why it's not even real. So there are three things that exist today that haven't existed at any time since the 1930s. You know, one of the main things in my life that I've learned is that whenever I've been surprised, it's because uh, of things that haven't happened to me before. Uh, and mostly in, haven't happened in my lifetime. So that I've had it to study history, and because if it's happened before. And those three things that are happening today um, are uh, last happened in the 1935 to 40 period. And, th and what I mean is, first, there's a large wealth gap. It's a big thing. It'll change, it'll affect markets, it'll affect our society in a very important way. So at that wealth gap produces populism of the left and populism of the right. And there's a war that is going on. And that war has a big effect on markets and it has a big effect on, on economies, it has a big effect on markets. So if we were to say, what would be the impact, let's say, of a, um, a, a democratic election and how taxes will change as a result of that tech, corporate taxes and so on, they'll be unwound. And so that will be an issue in pricing of markets and so on. But there's a large wealth gap that's not being dealt with. So the large, so there's a large wealth gap at the time that there's not effective monetary policy. So number one, large wealth gap and political gap and polarity that we are at each other's throats and, and it is not functional. The combination of how the media and the political system works or doesn't work together is a major problem. Number two, very much like the 30s, number two is the absence of the effectiveness of monetary policy because you can't make it go further. Europe is dead in the water, Japan is dead in the water, and so you can't just print more money and put it in the hands of investors and that system is just is not gonna work. So now you have to deal with the mechanics <clears throat> of um, do you have political coordination? I don't think so. Do you have political coordination working with monetary coordination? Politicians can't be coordinated with each other, and they can't be coordinated with uh, monetary policy. So you don't have the stimulus. Now let's imagine you have a downturn, and you don't have a good stimulus. Very similar to the 1930s. Okay, it's not a pretty picture. If we have a wealth gap that we're at each other's throats, and this is when times are good, when the stock market's at the high and the unemployment rates are low, imagine what it's going to be like when we get a downturn. And a downturn will come. When we get a downturn, we don't have effective monetary policy. And number three in that time is the, um, uh, the important thing, is the change in um, the, world, the world order. Um, meaning what we have now is not a... Um, unipolar world. We, we don't have, history has shown that um, periods of peace follow periods of war because there becomes a dominant world power and you create a world order. And no one wants to fight the dominant world power. And that's been the nature of what we've had since essentially World War II. And then when there's a rise of a, a, a power to challenge an existing power, then there is conflict. There's going to be conflict. There are going to be certainly lots of things to disagree with. And so when we deal with, the, let's say, the rise of China or other countries, or perhaps the decline of the United States in some ways, 
um, we have things to argue about. So there's different kinds of wars. We call them wars. But there's, there's a trade war. There's a technology war. There's a geopolitical war. And um, there could be a capital war. The capacity of that war to, is, is a material thing. So when we look at that analogous position, I would say um, you, you're at the end of the, 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 a cycle, meaning the force that drove us from 2008 to 9, the bottom in 2008 and 9, to where we are today, which was quantitative easing and the lowering of interest rates and corporate tax cuts, cannot push us farther. We can't go farther. And from there, we have those elements of risk. So when I look at it is, yes, it's crazy. It's crazy that we have negative uh, bond yield. We're, in my opinion, we're near the end in late stages of a reserve currency system. We have a fiat monetary system. This, none of this is not really unfamiliar to longtime viewers and listeners to True News. And, uh, right? Doc, I watched that entire uh, presentation. presentation one night, uh, sitting in her vehicle while Susan was shopping. <laughs> so uh, it, was, it was a long one, but that was fine with me. I was like, Susan, keep shopping. I want to watch, watch this entire uh, video. Um, look what he said. Uh, first of all, at the very beginning, he said, in his life, he's only, the things that have caused him problems were things that surprised him that he didn't ever face before in his lifetime mm. because he had no reference point. He had no reference point of what to do, how to process it, you know, caught off guard by it. Right. So this is what, and he said he studies history. Right. That's Friends. what I just said a few minutes ago. If you study history, you will not be caught off guard because you'll look at the circumstances and say, hey, this matches a certain time period in history where the conditions produce a certain result. And what I've been telling people is that we, in America, we are ripe for a Jacobin revolution, like the French Revolution, uh, or, or a Bolshevik communist revolution. We're very ripe for that right now. And I don't want either one. Extremely violent, bloody revolutions. Tens of millions of people died in the Bolshevik Revolution. Hundreds of thousands of people were decapitated in Paris for up to over 10 years. Right. Think about it, they were decapitating people for a decade. Anybody that disagreed with the revolution got their heads cut off. So um, he said that there were three things that are contributing to this uh, pressure for a crisis. A wealth gap, that's obvious. Uh, the absence of uh, sound monetary policy and you were saying to me, Doc, that uh, Japan is doing the same thing? Yes, they've, they've started their own uh, repo system uh, because they're now being caught off guard and having enough funds for the various financial institutions in Japan and uh, some sectors in Asia. So they're now following the U.S. plan, the U.S. Um, you know, pattern Monetary that, strategy. that's been uh, set up. It's too late for Europe. They, they can't dig themselves out in Europe. Uh, but Japan still has enough, you know, uh, flow going through their system where they can still, you know, goose the system out a little bit further here. But Ray Dalio here is saying it's it's the end of, you know, fiat monetary policy. We've taken it only so far. Uh, you know, there's only so much that we can do with reserve currencies and interest rates. I mean, with uh, negative yields popping up all over Europe we've, and toying around with the idea here and even laughing about the president laughed about, wouldn't it be great to have a negative yield here on a, on a note and said no it wouldn't be great it's this it, it's like the four horsemen of the apocalypse mm -hmm. you say yeah i like horses no uh, it's a danger thing i mean it's Doc, something to be warned about way back you know at the 2008 crisis uh, you know when they had the tarp bailout mm -hmm. and the money started flowing from the fed and people were shocked that the Fed was printing uh, that much money and injecting it into the markets and uh, people who believe in conservative 
sound monetary policy. Saving, we're, just we're, saving money. Well, people were saying this, this is a recipe for disaster. It's, it's, it, it will not, it's not going to work. It's going it's, it's to bring a disaster. Well, none of us, none of us imagined that this could continue as long as it has. Here we are now, two, going into 2020. I mean, they started back in 2008 doing this stuff. Twelve full years of but it. But I remember old Jim Willie. All right. God bless him, Jim Willie. And Jim told me, and he told a lot of people back then, he said, baby, it's QE to infinity. That's right. right. I was back in 2008, 2009. I'm like, what are you talking about, Jim? He goes, they can't stop it. You're right. It'll never stop. This will never, ever stop like until, until the entire system implodes. And here we are going into 2020, and they're still printing money. It's QE to infinity. It's the race. It's a mad race to the abyss. Yes. They all know it. They know. Th it's, like, it's like crazy pilots in an airplane that are flying the plane headfirst through a tunnel, you know, through, a, through a, a, a cave going straight down. They know the ground's going to hit them eventually. They're going straight to the abyss. They know it. And you think about all the dead bankers. Is this why we're seeing so many dead bankers showing up around the world still? I mean, this is a trend that begun years ago. But even as of this past month, we have President Trump and Jeffrey yes. Epstein's banker yeah. showing up dead. Something else that Mr. Dalio said that really caught my attention was, you see how toxic, it, toxic the environment here is in America right now. Uh, where the, it's talking about issues, where it's talking about policy, personalities. I mean, it's not like we can have a, a conversation anymore. We've got to fight. We're at each other's throats. Right. And this is when the markets are up, where unemployment yes. is down, where credit is easy. I mean, all these things. There's not Every, food lines. Everybody should be happy right now, right? But everybody wants to fight. What we want to fight. What's going to happen if there's just a, a slight turn of the screw? Just, just a little bit. Just a little turn of the screw. How about if there's a big turn of the screw? That's even worse. Okay. How about if you have a, an impeachment of the president and a banking collapse at the same time, in the same month, brought to you by Washington? What's going to happen? You're going to have revolution in this country. And if that happens on a Monday, let's say, what does Tuesday look like? I mean... What does, what does our nation look like on Tuesday morning when Monday afternoon that happens? That's right.